Hello everyone and welcome to B3.3 and IV biology, which is muscle and motility. So let's get started. Okay, so all living organisms move in some shape or form. So there's movements within the body, such as peristaltis or ventilation. Um, and then we have a locomotion, which is the actual movement of an organism from one place to another, what we would consider movement, right? So the ones that only have those first internal movements are called sessile, so that could be plants. And then the ones, the organisms that can do both, so they can also move from one place to another, are called motile, so that could be birds or us humans. So what are reasons to actually move from place to place? So locomotion, it uses energy, so it, it has to have benefits for the animal. Well, some benefits are foraging, so for example, bees fly from flower to flower looking for nectar and pollen. Escaping from danger, so gazelles run away to escape from lions. Then searching for a mate, so lions actually do this. They leave their, it's called their pride, right, their community to go find another one, and this avoids inbreeding. And migration is another reason, so to avoid food scarcity, some animals such as snow geese, pictured here, migrate, in this case between the Arctic North America and the Atlantic coast of the U.S., so now we're going to look at skeletal muscle because it's essential for movement. So skeletal muscles are made of striated muscle fibers, and these contract when they're stimulated by a motor neuron, which uses the neurotransmitter acetylcholine across the synapse. The synapse in this case is called a neuromuscular junction. So one motor neuron is normally branched to stimulate many different muscle fibers, and this helps coordinate contraction. So what is a motor unit? So a motor unit is a single motor neuron <laughs> together with all the muscle fibers that it stimulates. Let's look at how contraction actually works. So muscle fibers, which we just talked about, are made of myofibrils, and these consist of sarcomeres linked end to end. This is a sarcomere, so a myofibril will be a sarcomere, another one, another one, etc. So Sargomeres have actin filaments and thicker myosin filaments here in red. And then actin is linked to a set disc at the end. So the set disc is found here and here. How does muscle actually contract? Well, it's through sliding of actin and myosin against each other. So as you can see here, myosin has heads which form cross bridges to binding sites on actin. What happens is ATP binds to myosin, as shown here, and that causes them to detach from actin, as you can see. Then ATP is hydrolyzed, causing myosin to change its angle, as you can see here. It now binds to actin further from the center, so it's further here than it was here. And then the heads can, so the myosin heads can push the actin inwards, right, in this direction. And that's called a power stroke. So basically, the actin here, you can see it here as well, it moves inwards, right? Um, and that causes muscle contraction. So in the sarcomere, by the way, the areas where myosin and actin overlap are called the dark bands, and where they do not, so there's only actin, they're called light bands. So basically, when muscle contracts, the light bands become way smaller because the actin is going inwards. Okay. Also for muscle contraction, titan is the largest polypeptide discovered to date, and it is very, very elastic. Where is it? It's these blue lines over here. So it basically connects myosin to the set disc and holds it in its correct position. So it prevents overstretching of the sarcomere, but it also, importantly, adds to the force of contraction by releasing energy when it recoils. So basically, titan can stretch and that serves to lengthen a muscle, that is to relax. But then when it recoils, when it goes back to its original shape, it provides energy for contracting. Now, for it to stretch in the first place, though, it needs energy as well. And that is provided by the antagonist muscle. So let's look at antagonist muscles. What are they? So we can see an example here with the intercostal muscles, which we looked at during ventilation. So they are muscles between the ribs and they are made of external and internal layers. The thing is, these external and internal layers are orientated differently, meaning contraction of different layers moves the rib cage in opposite directions. So when the external intercostal muscles contract, that expands the rib cage, allowing inhalation. At the same time, that stretches the internal intercostal muscles. So it's what we just talked about. That stores potential energy in the titan of the internal intercostal muscles because titan stretches. 
However, then during exhalation, the internal intercostal muscles contract, and that's helped by tighten, which was stretched and can now recoil, right? And it's the external now during exhalation that will expand and tighten will store potential energy. So do you see how they're antagonistic, right? They do the exact opposite at any given time and thus help each other uh, to contract. Okay, now onto skeletons. So skeleton, the skeleton is a hard framework that supports and protects an animal's body. There's exoskeletons, uh, such as the ones arthropods have, such as spiders, uh, and those are outside the body. And then endoskeletons are internal, and that those are found in vertebrates, such as humans. Now, skeletons act as anchorage for muscles, and they also act as levers, so for the first part, so for anchorage for muscles. So um, a muscle is normally connected to two parts of a skeleton. So there's an insertion, where contraction causes movement in the biceps, it's found here. And then there's an origin, which is found here in the biceps, which is fixed. So that does not cause movement. And then bones also act as levers, as I said. So they can change the size and direction of the force. Uh, some key terms, which I'm afraid you have to memorize, is the pivot point. In this case, it's called the fulcrum, right? And that's where the joint, uh, that's the joint, right? It's where one bone meets another bone. And then the force applied to the lever is called effort. You can see that here. And that's applied by muscles via the tendons, right, to the bone. We just talked about the fulcrum and how it's found at joints. So some joints actually allow bones to move, and those are called articulated joints. And because most have a similar structure, they're called synovial joints. So these have bones, such as the femur here, and those provide the anchorage for the muscles. But then most importantly, let's look at this part. So they have cartilage, and cartilage covers the bone at the joint to prevent friction and the rubbing of bones. Then we also have synovial fluid found here between the cartilage, and it lubricates the joint and again prevents friction. There's also ligaments seen in purple. These have collagen and prevent aberrant movement um, of the bones, and it also forms the joint capsule, right? So it's not um, labeled here, but the joint capsule is basically the entire thing, right? And then we also will have tendons, right, which attach the muscle to the bone. Not all joints are made equal, though. So some can move more than others. They have different range of movements, and the range of movements are determined by the capsule and the ligaments. So for example, the elbow is a hinge joint because it only allows movements in one plane, flexion and extension. But the hip joint, for example, is a ball and socket joint. It has a much greater range of movement, so protraction and retraction, abduction and adduction, and rotation. So it can basically move in three dimensions, right? In three planes. And finally, let's look at the adaptations for swimming, which is another type of locomotion. So uh, animals which swim are streamlined. That means they're shaped to minimize resistance since water is much denser than air. They're widest near the front, and then they're normally tapered towards the rear. All of their flippers, flukes, and dorsal fins are normally, they normally have an elongated profile, again, so that swimming is streamlined. Their body surface is normally very smooth, and they have no hair, so all of this is meant to reduce friction. Now, if we look at their actual fins, they have flippers as front limbs, and these are used for steering, and in their tails, they have flukes, um, and these increase thrust, so they can move up and down, increasing speed. And then they also normally have a dorsal fin found here, which is not labeled, which provides stability. Now, in terms of breathing, they have a blowhole here, which is literally a hole from their larynx to the upper surface of their head, allowing them to breathe. And then they also have no connection between their mouth and their lungs, avoiding uh, water from entering them, which would be very, very problematic. Great, so that's all for the actual content. Let's do some recap questions. So as always, I'll give you three seconds to think. The image shows a synovial joint. Which of the following is a synovial capsule? This should be quite clear. In three, two, and one, it's C, right? So A is the ligament, B is um, the synovial fluid, D is the cartilage, and C surrounding it is the capsule. Now, which of the following are reasons for locomotion? Again, this should be pretty straightforward. Pause now if you want to think, but in three, 
two, and one, all of the above. I didn't explicitly mention three, but it's obvious, right? It's to escape from danger. So a fire or, well, an earthquake is harder to run away from, but in general, it's escaping from danger. That could be being hunted, but also a natural disaster. And then the two first are obvious. Uh, and finally, which of the following is the elbow joint capable of? Okay, this might take some more thinking, uh, or maybe you do remember, but in three, two, and one, flexion. So abduction and rotation, for example, the hip can do that, but not the elbow. And then inversion is something that uh, joints in the foot can do. But again, the elbow is one plane only forward and backwards, right? So that's flexion and extension, and that's it. Okay, amazing. So hopefully this was clear. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments, and I'll see you next week for the next topic. Have a great week, everyone.